Welcome, I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Gospel According to John, An Encounter with Grace and Truth. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 7 of our study, which covers the Gospel According to John, Chapter 6, Verses 1 through 21. As we left off, we have seen Jesus in Jerusalem for the celebration of the feast, and he has just concluded a rather heated argument with the Jewish leaders. Um, after which, it was probably a good idea for Jesus to get out of town. Uh, this is going to be a cycle throughout the Gospel according to John. We've already seen it now twice. Jesus rolls into town for feast, uh, he does something of significance at the feast. First time it was cleansing the temple, then this recent time it was that whole healing on the Sabbath. Now, again, he is leaving town. Uh, that's two instances, it will not be the last by a long shot. The one time he doesn't leave town, not to spoil things very much, but I think we all know how the story ends, he gets killed. Um, and he's not ready to do that yet. We're building to that, but we're not there. So he's going to leave, uh, which he does. Uh, and where does he go? Um, if you're not very familiar with the geography of the, re of the region, which would make sense because we don't live there, uh, and I used, I used the map uh, in our Bible study before commenting on this just to make sure that I was right that he was going up north because I had a vague sense of that, but I don't remember the geography that well between talking about things. So I checked on the map to make sure I didn't tell you something wrong. Uh, and he goes up quite a bit north of Jerusalem, back up into that region where he has been hanging out. Um, the interesting thing here, and it will be very interesting as we develop what's going on here, it's a little too soon to get into it a lot, but note, he's been celebrating a feast where everybody is supposed to go, uh, and then he leaves, and a bunch of people leave with him uh, and follow him because of the things that they've seen him do. Uh, that is going to be key for how we frame what's coming later in this chapter. A lot of cool things happen here in the first part of John chapter 6. All of them are very significant setup for what happens in the second part of John chapter 6, which is the next lesson. Uh, this in and of itself is very interesting and worth digging into, and there's a ton we can take from this, especially I think in terms of how we look at and relate to God, but there's also a ton in terms of setup for what's coming up. Um, so starting point, Jesus was at a feast in Jerusalem, left to the feast in Jerusalem. It's been unclear to right now what feast that has been, but we also know a bunch of people have followed him. That's where we're at now. We'll dig into that more as we move forward. Jesus is on the move. We see uh, in the previous section, he left Jerusalem, he's headed here up north, and he has then been in motion uh, since he left. Uh, now we're going to settle in a little bit to have some action. Uh, we're again a little too soon to orient what the, the full context of what's going on, but it's important that now we're going to stop for a bit. Uh, and where are we stopping? We've talked uh, in previous lessons about the significance of height uh, in terms of relationship to God as a symbol. Uh, again, reminder, uh, God is up. Up not being the geographical sense. He's not orbiting Earth in a spaceship. He's not XYZ coordinates in orbit or in space. Uh, at the time that all of this was written, up was a place that people could not go. Uh, other than climbing mountains. So again, God being up is God being where we can't go. Uh, but we can get closer by climbing high things. Uh, and so that's in orienting this uh, as on up in the hills, not only now do we see Jesus going up, 
but we see him drawing first his disciples who sit with him, but all these people who are following him are also going to be drawn up, be drawn toward God. Um, in the context of, this is really cool in the context of the conversation Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. Because she said, what is the right place to worship in Jerusalem or on this hill? Uh, and the expected right answer was in Jerusalem. We're in the middle of the feast, and Jesus, his disciples, and now a big crowd of people just left Jerusalem in the middle of worshiping at a feast, and they're going into these random hills, uh, which is where Jesus is taking them to worship, uh, highlighting again, and we're going to get back to in a very strong way here, what is really the right way and place to worship God. So we're orienting this whole thing in terms of they're doing something that frankly could be seen as a little naughty if you're a really good Jew. Uh, they're not sticking around Jerusalem through the whole feast, but they were there, they met their requirement as well. Uh, but this shift in action is very, very important. Uh, and it's anchored in that question of the Samaritan woman the Israel, from the heritage of Israel. There was a time before King David where there wasn't a Jerusalem to go to to worship uh, in these feasts. Uh, there was the Holy Land and people worshipped differently. Uh, and there was a time where there was a very different, very important mountain uh, in the history of these people that wasn't Jerusalem, that was connected with the events of first the Passover and then Pentecost, the history of the Feast of these people, which is, and even in other cases, Mount Horeb, uh, which God sanctified by being there, but there was nothing special about it. They never built a city. They never took the tabernacle there. It was never the center of government. It had none of the things that made Jerusalem sacred. And all it had was it was a place where you go to encounter God. Uh, otherwise, it was a random mountain. Uh, and so now we're leaving the place that has all of that baggage. There's not the tabernacle anymore. It's no longer a place where you actually are in the presence of this thing that represents God. It has vestiges of that in the form of laws that Jesus has already said, that's not going to be important. That's not where we are going to worship now. And the center of government, Jesus has made it pretty clear he doesn't care about making the government of uh, the Jews in Jerusalem the thing that matters. Uh, so what is left that makes Jerusalem so important? There is this rule that you go there for the feast that goes back a long time, and Jesus is observing that rule. Uh, but beyond that, he's also showing that even in the observance of that rule, that is not the thing that's important. So he is reframing fundamentally this feast uh, to be determined, uh, and shifting worship out of Jerusalem toward let's go close to God. Uh, and he seems to be suggesting by his behavior a little bit that it's kind of hard to get close to God in Jerusalem, which if you look back at the conversation he just had with the Jewish leaders and the experience he just had, how is anyone getting close to God in that environment? Uh, it is toxic to that kind of closeness to God. Even to the extent of, if you look back to his first trip there, the temple, the place you're supposed to go to get worship, to worship God, has been corrupted uh, by all of this commerce that's going on. There's no way after he drove those people out that everybody said, yeah, you're right, we're going to keep them out from now on. Uh, every, they certainly just went right back when he was done doing that. He highlighted, you have made this not a place where we can get close to God, the place that is supposed to be the place. Then he went back, took another try, and then thought, yeah, nope, that's not what we're doing now. Uh, after talking to 
a non-Jewish woman who genuinely wanted to be able to worship. Uh, he's highlighting the times they are changing. Uh, and we're going to shift the emphasis from these feasts, which is why, by the way, as Christians, we don't have a single holy place, and we don't have to go there every major feast or, you know, once in our lifetimes. We've gotten away from the sanctification of place, uh, which, again, is what Jesus is showing us. All of this, he could have gone anywhere to do this thing that we'll see uh, over the next two lessons is a very important thing. Uh, and he goes, but now seems like some random hills, although we'll talk about the symbolism of what's going on, and it'll get much deeper than that. But it's not a place that they don't even name it. Uh, he went up into the hills. Where? We know sort of generally geographically, but it's not like we have a city name or a specific name for the exact location. He just went up into some hills uh, and sat down, and people are sitting with him. This also ends up becoming kind of a parallel to the Gospel according to Matthew. There's the great Sermon on the Mount, um, starting around chapter 5, where Jesus goes up, sits down, and starts teaching everyone. This is very much also going to be a parallel to that, but while the Gospel according to Matthew is all about a series of moral teachings, we're going to see a different side of what Jesus is teaching here, uh, which will also be interesting. So that's a lot of comment for one verse about sitting down in the hills with his disciples, but it's an important shift. Uh, in terms of what Jesus is achieving, and it'll be, again, we're setting up. It's an important thing to keep in mind as we set up. Now the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand. To build on our previous point, before we get to Passover, the Feast of the Jews, what an interesting thing to say, as Jesus has just left Jerusalem. Uh, it creates a bit of a separation or distance just as, between Jesus and this feast, just as we did between Jesus and Jerusalem. Uh, it's limiting the feast, and it's, keeping, it's not giving it a universal character. The Passover isn't the feast of everyone. It's not even the feast of Israel. It's not the feast of God. It's not the feast of God's people. It's the feast of the Jews, a small subset remnant of God's people. Um, which is also odd phrasing. The Passover happened long before Jews were a thing. The Jews are the descendants of the tribe of Judah that returned from exile. Um, Jew, Judah, th that's where the word comes from, uh, of that southern kingdom. Uh, the Passover happened long before that as the Israelites came out of Egypt. So you would think the Passover is a feast of the Israelites, not of the Jews. So what is the commentary of the text here? Uh, what is John, the evangelist, suggesting? Uh, again, we see, I think we're seeing the feast characterized in two different ways, which again is critical for our setup here. There's the feast of the Jews that was going on in Jerusalem that Jesus left. That being let's say, a man-made artifice built on top of a revelation and a foundation of God. Um, you know, we have this today all over the place. Small T tradition builds on top of revelations of God. And these things can be very beautiful and very profound, or they can be not that, um, even within our church and elsewhere as well. Uh, we build on top of divine foundations all the time. Uh, sometimes we get the point, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do a good job, sometimes we don't. 
Um, we'll definitely, as we progress through these next two lessons, be talking a great deal about what is the point of the Passover. But our change in scenery and our labeling of that feast here at the beginning is telling us that the man-made spectacle built on top of the Passover of the Israelites that we're affectionately calling the Passover of the Jews that Jesus has left is not the thing we're going for. It's also pointing out, so we didn't see in the previous lesson what feast it was in Jerusalem. There was just a feast, and Jesus went there because there are three feasts every year where you have to go to Jerusalem. The Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, the Feast of Booths, and the Feast of the Passover. Uh, by the law, you are supposed to go uh, to all of those feasts. Uh, the law in Leviticus, you're supposed to go there for those three feasts. Also, they're not single-day feasts. They run eight-ish days. Um, so Jesus could have gone to Jerusalem for the unnamed feast, left after being there for some of the stuff at the beginning, and now he is outside of Jerusalem, but it's still the same feast. It's the Passover, I think. Because um, this seems pretty immediate in that the crowd has time to follow him. If it takes till the next calendar feast, people aren't hanging out with him here for more than a month. Uh, that is not a feasible thing. Uh, so I think this is very, very probably the same feast. From that point of view again, and we've been talking about it, this narrative should be seen as an extension of what we saw in the previous lesson. Um, which is why we have all of the, the separation is a contrast like we saw a contrast between Nicodemus, Jewish leader, Samaritan woman, not Jewish leader, but rooted in the traditions of Israel. Now we're going to do the same thing again. Passover feast, what the Jews are doing, move out of that into uh, a more Israelite version of the Passover, closer to its roots. Uh, so this is the Passover. What happens in the Passover? What happened? The original one. So there have been a series of plagues. There's this guy Moses and his brother Aaron, but most especially this guy Moses, uh, who has been working with Pharaoh to try to secure the release of his people, and Pharaoh has been somewhat reluctant uh, through a series of plagues. And finally, uh, God knows what's going to get attention. You know, it's the whole death of the firstborn thing. Uh, with that, the people are urged to prepare a very specific meal, one that you prepare quickly as though you're going somewhere, because they're going somewhere. Uh, then the plague comes, Pharaoh says, okay, you win, go, and they're ready right then because they know he's going to change his mind, or God does at least. Uh, they take off, he changes his mind, follows them. They cross miraculously across a body of water to the other side. And when they get there, they are free from the Egyptians. And the Egyptians don't make it across the water. Uh, so it's a, the Passover, the original one, was a feast of haste and of travel, not of setting up in Jerusalem. So what Jesus is doing here really is very oriented in that. He is, although he's not saying that he is, he's acting uh, very much like Moses in that here he is in this entrenched political slavery of a sort. Um, and he is leading himself, his disciples and the people who would follow him out of that, creating a really interesting commentary on the worship practices and general behavior of the Jews. They end up being depicted as a thing that is kind of enslaving the people and not freeing the people. Um, in a context of, we just saw them using the law as an excuse for, you shouldn't have been healing this person. Um, it's very, that's a very much more 
binding and constricting thing than it is a freeing and God is working sort of thing. Uh, so I think the imagery works. Uh, we didn't have a series of plagues, that's fine, but we are very much, we had this movement through this Passover. And where are we now? We are next to a body of water. Uh, Jesus has traveled along next to it. We'll see more as we develop the image. Uh, but we're very much anchoring all of this action in the Passover, and we're moving with a group of people like Moses did when the Israelites left Egypt. We've left Jerusalem, we're up in some hills, and surprise, it's not just Jesus and his disciples, we have a lot of people who have come with us. And that raises a problem. Um, nobody's really prepared for the idea of traveling uh, from the point of view of eating. Uh, which, it turns out, is a pretty important thing for people to do. Uh, so, not a small problem. Not a new problem. When the Israelites fled Egypt, they had the same problem. They ended up wandering around for a very long time, uh, and even though they did attempt a little bit to provision for the journey, they definitely did not have enough food to wander for 40 years, uh, which fairly quickly, probably not 40 days, which fairly quickly led to the problem of we have no food. There had to be a problem that was addressed through divine intervention. Moses talked to God, God took care of the problem. Here Jesus then does an interesting thing. He certainly knows what's going to happen, right? This is Jesus, this is God. Uh, he's not surprised by what he's going to do. He doesn't ask this series of questions and then say, oh wait, I know what I can do. I can fix this in other means. So he's not brainstorming here with his disciples when he asks this question. Um, and I think again, it's very significant that it's oriented in the context of Passover. So he asks Philip, how are we to buy bread so that the people may eat? Loaded question, because it assumes how the solution to the problem should work. Um, it certainly feels like Jesus is testing Philip here a little bit. Um, but if you're doing this via human means, that's how you do it. You're not going to scavenge from the land enough for all these people. You're not going to grow food when everybody's here now. There's not going to be enough wildlife to hunt. The only reasonable human solution to this problem is to use money to acquire food uh, and to feed people. Uh, originally, there was, in the first Passover, that was a part of the cause of despair is the people didn't see how there was a way they could eat. Um, and so they were complaining about that. Jesus is heading this off at the pass, but he's also hoping, I think, to show his disciples a very important thing, which is, as happened in the first Passover, there are non-human solutions to what seem like human problems especially when you're with Jesus or Moses, uh, but especially Jesus. Uh, and it's a, it's a good measure of faith, uh, and it's one that affects all of us. If you are with Jesus and you see a problem that is not solvable by human means, do you give up? Uh, do you just say, yep, no, this, isn't, this doesn't work, uh, there's no answer here? Uh, or do you open yourself to the possibility that there could be solutions to the problem beyond what you see? Uh, Philip falls into the trap of the question. Jesus frames it in a human way. 
Philip answers it in a human way. We definitely don't have enough money to do this. Um, there is, fundamentally speaking, the economics is a study of scarcity and division of scarce resources. As human beings, we have limits to everything. Um, there is a finite amount of food. There is a finite, finite amount of minerals and oil and other resources. There is a finite amount of clean water and air. Um, even things that we've taken for granted are basically infinite, uh, especially as the environment is decaying, unfortunately. We're seeing our more and more, in fact, limited. Everything is limited, is finite. Um, and money becomes a vehicle by which we allocate finite resources. Um, but the whole fundamental way that we look at everything is through the context of scarcity, of limit. Uh, there's a finite amount of stuff, and there's fairly close to an infinite demand if everybody could have everything they wanted. Not infinite, but a lot more than the amount of stuff there is. Um, and so we end up in various systems wherein we try to allocate a limited supply of resources. And we frame every interaction we have with stuff at a very deep level in, context, in the context of our awareness of that scarcity. And this question orients this problem in that mindset. It is, we don't have enough, or do we have enough? Um, and Philip comes back and just says, there is not enough. There not being enough money equates to there not being enough bread. He's, it's a means to an end. But money is a form of allocating of the resource of food. Um, and it's the only one he knows of to get that food. That's how we do things. I trade money for goods and services. I work to get the money. It's a whole system of exchange. Everything we do, you know, everything we do is based on that. Um, so Philip is answering again in the context of scarcity, or importantly, in the context of what we don't have. Um, and Jesus framed the question to kind of aim toward where is your faith at right now? Do you have the ability to, how are you seeing things again? Uh, are you seeing things through your human eyes, through your human brain, through the way that you are used to looking at things? Or, in the context of this Passover, where we commemorate that God literally made bread rain from the sky, are you able to possibly open yourself to the idea that you don't need money for bread with God? And so far, Philip has not seen that there is a way to get bread that doesn't involve money. Um, and, and who would, right? It's very easy to be hard on these guys when we look at how they do things, but they are also, I think, very much speaking for all of us and just end up getting kind of looked down on a little bit because we think, oh, I definitely would have had faith and it would have been fine. Yeah, say that when you start to get hungry um, and you don't know where the food is coming from. If you've ever been in a spot where you've been food insecure and not known where your next meal is coming from and not known that you have enough money for that, that is... That becomes a very hard situation to say, oh, yeah, God will take care of that. Because uh, that sort of thing leads us to focus very much on what we don't have. Uh, hunger is a great driver of focusing on what you don't have, um, as are other lacks that seem important. So, part one, again, all oriented in the context of the Passover. Part one, Philip focusing on what we don't have. Jesus has framed a question. We have all these people to feed. Also note that he's sort of assumed we are going to take care of feeding these people. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, and why Jesus thinks that's his responsibility at all. Uh, again, in the context of the Passover, 
Jesus being Moses-esque here, uh, Moses also ended up, although in that case it was the people coming to him to whine, uh, also ended up assuming responsibility for making sure the people are fed. So not surprising that Jesus is doing the same thing. Uh, he's also teaching his disciples to do the same thing. Uh, as we've been building the narrative, we also recently were talking about food and harvest and what you work for. Uh, and Jesus said, don't work for food. Uh, it's not an accident that it's, we're building on that to this idea of what did Jesus think was important was the harvest, was the people. We don't put our efforts toward food or sustenance. We put our efforts toward doing the work of God, which is to take care of these people. He wants to take care of these people. They need to eat. The working for food doesn't matter because, as we're about to see, scarcity is irrelevant uh, if you're Jesus. Uh, but we'll build on all those themes. It all connects and is meant to connect. Um, so Philip focused, with a little help from a leading question from Jesus, on the scarcity, on the lack, on what we don't have. Um, then we see Andrew come in with a different solution. Still, he gets halfway there, which is really all God needs. Um, he says, well, what do we have? We have these five loaves and these two fish. Um, so, Jesus, I don't know what you can do with this. I'm spitballing here. But look, th this we have, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, so he gets there a little bit in terms of, I'm not going to focus on what we do don't have. I'm going to focus on what we do have. But then I'm going to fall back into that scarcity thinking and retreat back to, but it's not enough. But halfway. Um, and that's all, as we'll see, that's all God needs from us. Um, instead of when you're in that situation uh, where you're worried about what you don't have, focusing so much on that, it can help a great deal to instead stop and think, what do I have? And to bring that to God to work with. Um, we'll talk more about that uh, as we progress through the lesson. Uh, five loaves, two fish adds up to seven. Numbers are often important in the Bible. The number seven is almost always important in the Bible. Uh, why? What is it? Uh, you know, you have seven days of creation. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, set back. Every time you have then seven days, we call that a week. They had weeks as well. You go through your cycle of seven days, you start over, you do another one. You start over, you do another one. Your time doesn't ever stop. It just becomes a way you get to the end and that means it's time to start over. It's, you need more. Uh, there's more, uh, and if you've done some of our other studies, uh, especially Genesis and gone through the beginning of creation, we almost always mention that there's more about the idea of that seventh day being an incomplete thing, pointing forward or looking forward for more. Um, the number seven throughout the scriptures points toward something more coming. So we have a unit that is self-contained, but not done, not perfect, not finished. Uh, so a week ends at seven, but time doesn't end with a week. It just starts over again. Uh, a couple examples, at least one example off the top of my head. Jacob works for seven years to marry the woman he wants to hear, wants to marry. Uh, his father-in-law pulls a bait and switch. He marries the wrong woman, uh, Leah, instead of Rachel. So he has to work seven more years to marry the woman he wanted to marry. Seven was not done. He was not done working to marry the woman he wanted to marry. He had to do it again after that. It wasn't finished. Um, and the number seven always works that way in the Bible. You get to the end of something, but you're not done. It just starts over again, uh, like weeks do. You come to the end of one week, you start the next week. You're not done. Uh, you start over. Um, long way of saying, 
What does the number seven here mean then? Uh, it exactly is representative of that with food. You have a limited amount of food, it's done, here it is. But it has the potential to be something more. Just like seven days aren't a complete and finished thing, seven amount of food is not a complete and finished thing. We left to our own human devices can't make seven food into eight food, which would be complete, would fill in that gap, would make it full. We can't do that. We can't take seven of whatever kind of food and make it eight. We can't make a week not start over the same way that it just was. Um, we can't do that. We are limited. We're finite. Things are scarce. That's not true with God. God can cross that bridge from limited to unlimited, from not finished to finished. Um, Jesus here, and everything Jesus is doing is representing that move. So God, as the craftsman, created the world in seven days, but left something hanging and unfinished. How did he create those days? He spoke. Let there be light, all these other things. And that happened. But it was a form of God working and crafting. Uh, and he got through seven days, and it kept going and going and going. And, and it wasn't done. And it was, everything was limited. Everything was finite. And it was bound in this finite, dead cycle. Again, dead being everything trending directionally toward death. Um, and it's stuck. All of reality is of our creation has been stuck in this repeating the seven cycle. Um, and now he has spoken again his word into the world in the form of, in the beginning was the word. That word is now incarnate. He's sent into, the, he's spoken again into his creation. And in Jesus, we're moving that seven cycle of creation into a new thing. We're moving beyond the repeating stuck pattern. We're moving beyond dead, finite, limited, scarce, into alive, infinite, unlimited, abundant. Uh, and the only thing we need to do that is the divine creating power of God's word, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't, as it turns out, need money. Money is another form of scarcity. Uh, it is how we acquire things in a scarce system. But if we're not any longer in a scarce system, we don't need money for things. We can make seven food however much food we want it to be. Uh, and it just is that way. It doesn't the scarce becomes abundant, the finite becomes infinite. Most importantly, the dead becomes alive. That's the big change that we're affecting, but this is a sign of that. Um, so, seven food feeds 5,000 by fundamentally, from a symbolic point of view, just becoming eight food. At eight food, it's enough to feed any number of people, because eight is that completing, abundant power of God entering into the world. Uh, we'll talk more about especially that uh, when we talk about what Jesus is doing here and how he does it. Uh, but there's the setup, and again, we're doing this in the context of the Passover. It's not unprecedented for God to feed a lot of people uh, through impossible ways. In fact, the main precedent for that also occurred during the Passover. So, spoiler alert, uh, but we've already talked about Jesus kind of being... Moses asked here. I probably anticipated this point a little bit in the last one, but you know, it's on a roll and it connected and wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. This is where we see the abundance of that eight. Uh, there's not just enough, there is more than enough. Uh, that's what abundance looks like. It's no matter what need there is, 
there is more than enough to fill that need. Symbolically, we're doing it in the form of food here. Seven food becomes symbolically, again, eight food, uh, which is more than enough for 5,000 people. Uh, death becomes life, which is more than enough than our sin and death can take from us. The problem originally with the life that was given to our first ancestors was that it was a limited life. It was scarce. And in that scarce resource, they lost it. Because there was a finite amount of life that they had that was subject to being lost in the form of sin. Um, everything was still finite. Uh, and so once life was gone, there's not enough money to go buy more eternal life. Uh, there was no way to get it back because it was limited. Uh, now we're moving into a state where life itself becomes unlimited. Uh, food is a cheap parlor trick compared to uh, unlimited, truly eternal life that resists being squandered in the form of sin. Um, so, again, that the shift, and it's the mark of Jesus, it's the fundamental shift. We're elevating creation. We're changing the directionality of creation from moving, tending, trending toward death to trending toward life, to trending toward, in a spiritual rather than a physics sense, Jesus is reversing entropy, uh, the tendency of uh, everything to eventually run down. Jesus in his person is instead causing everything that is connected to Jesus to trend toward the opposite, to more life, more abundance. Uh, and all you have to do to achieve that is somehow Jesus is the one doing it. It's through Jesus that that happens. The question that that raises is, okay, this guy can do that. How does that work for me? Becomes the next stage of this question, which we won't answer in this lesson, but that we're setting up for again. Uh, but first we have to establish that in Jesus. Jesus is himself the creative power of God on earth that has the ability to complete every part of creation he touches and to bring it to fullness and to abundance. Uh, and so we see that's what he did here with the food. Uh, but that ends up being, again, still just a setup. Also, how does Jesus do this? Uh, we alluded to it a little bit. Again, who is Jesus in John's Gospel? He is that creative power of God entered into the world, the Word of God. The text doesn't say Jesus pulled out his magic wand uh, or Jesus touched the food. It's not the uh, synoptics where he breaks it and then keep, and where people just start handing it out and then there's more and more. It's, it's just a word of Jesus. And it's not God make more bread and fish. Uh, he doesn't. It's not even that ask. It's what does he do? He gives thanks for what he does have. Um, the idea of thanksgiving is still very important in what we do now as Catholic Christians. Um, half of and our every liturgy is the liturgy of the Eucharist. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. Um, we likewise are taking a thing that is finite, limited, scarce, bread, and we are giving thanks, and we're making it into that thing that is not limited, finite, scarce, dead. We still do this today. Um, every Catholic priest, uh, and some Orthodox ones, all of them also, uh, have the power given by God to do this, to take a finite, limited thing, a seven of bread, of life, uh, 
because of course food is also equated with life. Food makes us live. And make it a different kind of food that makes us live in a different kind of way. And we do it the same way Jesus did here, by giving thanks. Um, and then the rest is just sort of take, taken care of. Uh, that's the important part here, is Jesus gives thanks to God, and then this food that is not enough is enough. Uh, we give thanks to God, and our death becomes life. Uh, part of the challenge is it can be very hard to give thanks to God when you are still in the state of lacking something. Uh, it's through being thankful for what's there that it becomes enough, uh, and more than enough. Uh, Jesus doesn't say thank you after, he says thank you before. Uh, and that suggests to us something key about our, our own attitude toward God. But it's through his word, and it's through specifically his word of thanks that this happens. The people are understandably amazed by this, even though, from Jesus' point of view, this is just a warm-up act, uh, and we're, again, setting something else up. Uh, the people are starting to see a form of the same connection we've just been talking about. This is indeed the prophet. Most likely fulfillment of that is Moses. Uh, Jesus is doing a very Moses thing here. Uh, there's going to be a whole conversation about that in the next lesson. The people are starting to identify a bit of the connection. Uh, for us, it will be interesting to, to look at, does Jesus see this the same way that they do? Because uh, he's doing some very, again, Moses-y things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the way that Again, in the Gospel according to John, there's a constant tension between how Jesus sees himself and how other people see him. And in general, the rule is nobody is seeing Jesus correctly. Uh, and that creates this tension and even often some irony. Uh, certainly present here in that the people are seeing, oh, this is Moses. And, you know, Jesus is being kind of Moses-y. And at the same time, Jesus is definitely not Moses. Uh, nor is he we'll see, uh, trying to portray himself as such. He's suggesting a different thing. Uh, we'll get to that uh, in the next lesson. Uh, they're close, but they're not quite there. Uh, and what we're going to see is there is a huge gulf between people who see with their human eyes a thing and like and latch onto it as a human thing, and the smaller number of people who are able to see behind that to more of what it really is with the eyes of faith and how they respond to it um, as it develops. Um, so the crowd is not perceiving beyond what their human eyes are showing them. And yes, this is cool, um, but in that sense, Jesus is basically a wandering magician, right? He does amazing looking things, and oh, I got, I got free lunch, and I like that. So I like Jesus because of what he did for my human needs, uh, and it was kind of a neat spectacle. Uh, we like spectacle. Uh, but that's so far from who Jesus really is. They're seeing the thing that's meant to lead them to the point, and they're stopping at the thing. More of the same. That misperception about who and what Jesus is leads to a misperception about what you want him to do for you. Uh, if this guy can do this, what can we do to the Romans? We still want that king who will get rid of the Romans, and that's what the Messiah is. 
Uh, that's what's coming, right? We've seen their expectation. We're looking for Moses or Elijah or David. We're looking for these people to come uh, and to do what they did before, again, in a different context. So Jesus is showing this sign, let's make him the Messiah. Uh, let's make him king and force him to do what we want him to do. Uh, that is very much, and I think we're all sometimes prone to that, starting from what we need and want and trying to make God conform to that. Uh, they're not fully seeing him as God, or, you know, they would instead want to bow down and conform to him, which is the idea. Uh, they're getting part way there. There's something about this guy. And then they're ending with, what can he do for me? Uh, which is an attitude that, again, comes from a scarcity mentality. I lack things, uh, and I'm looking for God to fill in what I lack, but I'm looking for him to do it in the form of, I need more money to buy bread to feed these people. I'm looking for solutions through human channels, which is how Jesus originally framed this, was to say, let's not be looking at this this way. That's exactly how they're looking at it. They're seeing, here's some money to buy some bread, but instead it's, here is a guy to get rid of the Romans so we can have independence, which we think will give us more uh, of the different things that we think we want. Uh, which fundamentally makes it about them and not about God. They're trying to limit and constrict and constrain Jesus into something that is useful to them. Uh, and the vast irony here is that they want to do it to slightly help the problem, perceived problem of a lack in their lives. Jesus has just demonstrated that for God, scarcity is not an issue, that he can make infinite out of finite, and they want him to make a little more out of a little less uh, in the form of how their government and society is set up. Uh, when he has demonstrated the ability to literally do infinitely more than that. Uh, they don't want infinite, they want a little more. Uh, because they can have that on their terms. But the infinite comes on God's terms. Uh, they don't want it on God's terms. And that's really what leads us to reject God, is he's trying to give us more than we want, but it's different from what we want. Uh, and if we can't, again, see with the eyes of faith to what it truly is that he's trying to give us, then we can prefer just a little more to all and then some. Uh, we can prefer a little more enjoyment in this life to living forever. We can enjoy, we can enjoy that extra whatever, drink or sex or shopping or... Uh, making money or all of these things that we do to try to fill the lack that is existing in all of us as a result of how creation has been in a not finished or completed state. Uh, we try to finish it ourselves by making just a little bit more. God's saying, oh, I can do that, but this way is how that works. And we say, no, that's, that's fine. I don't want that. I want just, you know, a slightly better job with a little bit more money, uh, and, you know, all my problems are solved. Then I would have enough. And then we get that. Then I would have enough. Uh, what is it? One of the great tycoons at the turn of the century, I think it was Andrew Carnegie, I might be wrong, it was one of those guys, was at one point asked, how much money will be enough? Uh, this was one of the richest people on earth at that point in time. And his answer was, that's easy, just one dollar more. Uh, and that's how this works when we try to solve this problem this way. When we try to say, I just need this and it'll be enough. I just need this and it'll be enough. It's not enough because we're filling an infinite hole with a finite thing. We were made for God. We were made to have that infinity within us. Uh, and we find ways to try to fill an infinite hole with a finite thing. 
Here, people are correctly identifying that Jesus might be a good solution to their problems. But they're saying, I only want this much Jesus. I don't want this much Jesus. Um, and we, I personally do the same. I won't speak for all of you, because uh, some of you could be, probably are very much better people than I am. Um, but it's a tendency I'm fighting against a lot, is I think I want this thing from God, and just this one, this other thing, and then I'll be, then I'll be good. And, you know, it'll be so awesome, then I'll give thanks to God so much, right? Not, I'm giving thanks to God now, but I'll give so much thanks to God, and I'll be such a good Christian if, you know, I could find a wife. Uh, that would solve all of my problems, and I would, it would be sufficient. Uh, and that's just not how it works. Uh, first, you give thanks, then God will fill your scarcity with super abundance, but it might not be the kind you think you want. It will be better, but it might not be what you think you want. And if you end up continuing to prefer what you think you want, at best, that's all you will get, and it will turn out that it is never enough. Back now into motion. I won't talk too much about the extremely unusual thing that it seems not at all alarming that Jesus' followers leave him where he was. That is a little bit unusual, but you know, probably if Jesus tells you to do something like that, then at least his disciples would likely just do it. Uh, we don't hear him tell them to do it, but that would be... At any rate, we see that occur. Uh, everybody takes off in a boat uh, without Jesus. You can think more about that on your own. It is unusual. Uh, although, really, how often do we also set off on our own way without Jesus and expect him to catch up? Uh, the difference here is that he does. Uh, so... They are out on, again, where are we at in terms of setting? We're in the context of the Passover. Uh, again, the people of Israel fled from Egypt, passed through the, Red, the waters of the Red Sea, and ended up safe on the other side. Um, that's important here. Uh, also, how was the sea parted? There was a strong wind that came. Uh, and it dried out a part of the sea. So here we see his followers are out on, and the water became as land. Here we see followers are out, disciples are out on the boat. Again, that strong wind is blowing, uh, but they're out on the boat without Jesus. Uh, then they see Jesus walking up on the water as though it's dry land. Uh, and as soon as he gets in the boat, they also are on the land. Uh, so we see, just as Moses turned the water into dry land, Jesus shows first for him, the water is always dry land, right? Even when it's water, it's dry land. He can walk on it just like, he doesn't need to part the water because like, irrelevant, he's Jesus. He just walks on it like dry land, but he's very much passing over. Uh, and when he's around, as soon as he gets to where his followers are, the water where they are also becomes dry land immediately. Uh, so Jesus himself is the parting of the sea, uh, which is the thing that allows the Israelites to pass over from slavery into freedom, and what the thing that allows us to pass from death into life. It's Jesus. It's only Jesus. That because again we've talked about those waters representing death. So he's not parting the Sea of Tiberias or the Red Sea. Uh, that's trivially easy for Jesus. So is the other thing, but it's a bigger deal. Is he's instead parting the waters of death, uh, where Jesus is, the waters of death aren't. It's dry land. It's not death. It's life, it's not life, death. Jesus in him, and we talked in the previous lesson again about Jesus having life in himself. 
this is what that looks like, is death doesn't, it bounces off of him. Water in the form of representing death, it doesn't impact Jesus. He just walks over the top because he can't die or stay dead because he's always trending in the direction of life. Uh, so he can just walk casually right over the top of the water. He can casually, not so casually, but you'll get my point, he can experience death and not be dead and just keep on going. Uh, whereas everybody else would drown without a boat. Jesus ends up being kind of a boat, but even better, you don't even need the boat, you just need Jesus. And then you're not in the water anymore. Uh, you're on dry land. Uh, again, instantly. So, we're extending the image of the Passover, but we're doing it also as a new thing. We're not stuck in this finite thing of what the, pa of the previous Passover was. We're now moving toward what it foreshadowed, the infinite thing. Uh, the difference being one is slavery to freedom, the other is being death to life. Uh, the Israelites passed through the sea and still were hungry and still died. Uh, we pass through the waters of death and will never want again. Uh, so, strange to think that this is all still just the setup. Uh, but this is all still just the setup. Uh, so we've clearly oriented, to summarize our setup, We've clearly oriented, we've got the Passover going on. We're not so much worried about the Passover of the Jews in Jerusalem. We're going back to an earlier thing in order to go forward to a new thing. Um, Jesus is leading people out of where they've been entrenched to an out of a mindset and a reality of scarcity and of death. And is leading people toward abundance and life. Um, we're still missing some parts of the Passover that will be filled in here presently. Uh, there's a really key event uh, that we haven't touched on yet. All of this is to frame who Jesus is. Now we're going to also frame how we participate in that. Because right now Jesus just found all of his followers. He brought them to dry land, but they're still dying, right? So he has right now only symbolically brought them out of death. He's going to do more than symbolically, but we don't yet know how that works. How do we also live with Jesus? So the setup has all been placing Jesus in the role of the one who is going to be the life giver, uh, the bread giver. Uh, the one who leads us through the waters of death to life. Uh, so we've set that part up. Uh, now comes the part in our next lesson, how do I get that? This has been an overview of Lesson 7 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Gospel According to John, An Encounter with Grace and Truth. For more information, consult our written study, and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.